And since I was a neuroscience reporter, I knew I know about the face blindness, which is also called prosopagnosia. And um, Oliver Sacks had it. I read about, I read his description. And even when I read his descriptions of face blindness, where he had a lot of experiences that were a lot like mine, things like failing to recognize yourself in the mirror, and also failing to recognize your therapist and your therapist not believing you. <laughs> I, um, even though I'd had these similar experiences, I really didn't identify with him because he was very shy. But I've later, I've come to understand that face blind people actually fall into two camps where about half of us are embarrassed and shy and anxious about social situations. And half of us just barrel through life, assuming that anyone who looks in our direction might be our best friend. A person that I didn't know was face blind and he didn't know he was face blind, but I interviewed him because he has aphantasia is the famous scientist, Craig Venter. And it was so much fun to chat with him because I felt like I was looking into an alternative world where where I was really good at biochemistry or something. He's, he's famous for sequencing the human genome. And he and I had very similar educational trajectories. And if there's other AFANTs in the audience here, you may recognize this too. So basically his wife had almost a photographic memory. And when they were in college together studying for tests, she could remember where on the page she had seen, you know, particular information. She could memorize anatomical drawings, all of these things. And that's when Craig Venter realized that he could not do any of these things. And he, he talked to her and saw and realized that she was actually conjuring up images in her mind's eye. Again, like many of us, we didn't even know that was possible. And so he had a lot of trouble in, in early school where, where memorization is big, like with spelling and geography, geometry sometimes, um, maps, that kind of thing. He, he really struggled in school and it wasn't until later when things started getting more abstract and where conceptual understanding sort of took the fore, he started doing really well. And he believes that aphantasia is the magic sort of ability he's had to see things from a very, you know, 3000 feet up perspective. And I feel like that's also true for me. I'm a very big picture thinker and I am uh, not great with the details. But this isn't true for all AFANTs, right? There, you, you'll always find lots of exceptions. And it's been, I actually talked to a researcher who said that this has been very annoying for her because she's trying to learn about us as a group. And we are, you know, all individuals and everyone's bringing complicated strengths and weaknesses to the table here. Earlier you mentioned the, the SDAM and I, I struggle with that as well. Um, could you share a little bit more about that with our- It sounds like a terrible thing to have, severely deficient autobiographical memory. But the man who named it, he was just trying to bookend the opposite syndrome, which is highly superior autobiographical memory, which again, sounds amazing. But I actually am glad that I am on the SDAM side. This is a spectrum, right? Most people strike a balance between these two, two types of memory known as semantic and episodic memory. Episodic memory is memory that is where, that you can go back and do this mental time travel where you can almost relive important emotional moments from your life, where you can see what you saw then, where you can smell or touch or taste. It brings up old sense memories. And um, semantic memory is m memory that's very abstracted. It's memory for facts. It's, it's memory that you've learned from across different moments in your life. So for instance, if I was hiking with someone who had highly superior memory and a dog bit someone and we saw it happen, she would remember the weather, the color of the dog, like where exactly everyone was standing, what time of day it was, what we did immediately before and after. And I would lose all of that. But you know, if I'd seen dogs bite people more than once, I would abstract things like the characteristic pose of a dog when it's scared or angry or that kind of thing. So anyway, the people with highly superior episodic um, memory, they can, they actually often feel like they're getting lost in details in their lives. They often have OCD. They have a lot of trouble getting over things that are embarrassing or traumatic. 
And those of us on the other side of the spectrum, I mean, we miss that, that human experience of mental time travel and reliving important moments from our past. What we get in return is this high level perspective, which I think really helped me as I wrote my own autobiography. So as I'm writing this autobiography, by the way, and I'm learning all these things about myself, learning that I have SDAM, which is basically, it means I'm an amnesiac memoirist. I found out about two thirds of the way through my book. And I thought, oh my God, like, do I bury this so I don't lose my book deal? <laughs> But I, I, I didn't, and um, it turns out that though we don't remember as much, what we remember is just as accurate, possibly even more accurate than people on the other side of the spectrum, because we're less prone to false memories or changing your memories as you retrieve and relive them. I think that it's very cool that science is now beginning to take subjective experience seriously. In the past, we might have had a discussion where I would say, I can't visualize, and someone else would say, I can visualize. And we wouldn't really know if, if we were both reporting our inner experiences accurately. But thanks to fMRI and some other clever techniques, we actually do have objective evidence of whether people are reporting their internal experiences accurately. I actually, I had the opportunity to participate in a bunch of studies and in one of them, they tossed me into an fMRI machine and asked me to visualize and then compared me to someone who was neurotypical. And it was so interesting. The neurotypical brain, when it visualizes, looks a lot like vision in reverse. Vision is really interesting. It, it bounces back to the back of your head and then gets processed forward. So if you are visualizing, you start in your frontal cortex and you're like, hey guys, let's imagine an apple. And then your l earlier visual areas sort of like activate. And, um, and so they can actually tell if you're thinking about a face or a place or you know various other broad categories. They can't tell you're looking at an apple yet, but and my brain, you, there was a lot of frontal activity as I was like, come on, let's do it. And then there was nothing else. And I also discovered that my frontal cortex is very well connected to other regions of my brain, especially my temporal and occipital lobes. And, you know, this really, it really fits with my experience of being a very hands-off uh, manager <laughs> where, you know, I don't want to be bothered by the details. Like we're just, you know, we just take a very high level uh, approach to life. <laughs> I understand that there might be some folks in our audience today who are just now discovering that they um, are experiencing, um, you know, aphantasia or something else that you've spoken about. What advice do you have for them? It will blow your mind. It should blow your mind that other people just have a completely different experience of human consciousness than you do. But there are people who have really similar ones too. So welcome to the club of people who understands that there's just so many flavors of human consciousness available and it's you can't really know who what anyone else is experiencing. So yeah, don't panic. Um, Help, it could be helpful to get on support groups, but if you are really feeling like you're drowning, I mean, obviously go see a therapist, talk it out. It is a, it is kind of a big deal to learn after thinking your entire life that you're basically neurotypical to learn that you're very much not is shocking and it can help you. I mean, for me, I had to suddenly revise my entire life story and look at things that I thought I had figured out in an entirely new light. And that was a process, but it's kind of a cool process. And, you know, it's exciting. I thought at the age of 40 that I knew myself and boy, I was super wrong and it's humbling, but kind of fun. So my website, which is sadied.com, I have a lot of tests on there. So if you are curious, if you meet the clinical definition for face blind, aphantasia, things like that, you can find them on my website and you can also find lots of links to play. You can buy my book anywhere that books are sold. There's an audio book that I did myself. I had to audition to play myself and I got the role. So I was very happy about that. Yeah. So connect with me on social media. I love hearing from people and love hearing people, people's discoveries about themselves and others.